Welcome to the Wisconsin Music Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wisconsin Music Podcast, your go-to destination for discovering the incredible musical tapestry woven by the talented artists of the Badger State. Today we have a special treat for your ears as we sit down with the master of the instrumental guitar, none other than the enigmatic Pat Zydek, better known on stage as the sonic storyteller Elysian Stew. Did I say all that correctly so far? You did, yep. So far, Excellent. so good. In this episode, we'll delve into the artistry of Pat Zydek, a musician who skillfully combines fragments of musical influences to craft his sonic stew that is both nostalgic and contemporary. With a mission to invoke emotions, each composition is a journey through the forest of feelings, a testament to the profound impact music can have on our souls. But wait, there's more. Pat Zydek has just released a brand new album, and it's titled Driving the Desert to Burn a Million Dollars. You can find this captivating musical experience on all major streaming platforms, YouTube, iTunes, and more. So get ready to immerse yourself in the enchanting melodies and tales of Elysian Stew. Stay tuned to the Wisconsin Music Podcast, where we celebrate the sounds that make our steak unique, one artist at a time. So, Pat, welcome to the Wisconsin Music Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This, this is quite an honor. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for being on. So let's get the listeners um, introduced to you, kind of give them a summary of your music um, origin story. Uh, yeah, so um, basically I've been playing guitar most of my life. Uh, my father was a professional musician, uh, so he started me when I was four. Okay. Uh, pretty much had hopes and dreams of, you know, making it big and everything, and those were dashed at the age of 17, thanks to my father, which is an interesting story. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't done maliciously. It was done to let me realize that I wasn't good enough. Okay. <laughs> And uh, at that point, it was, uh, okay, now I have to come up with a plan B because I didn't have a plan B before. It was just it was going to be music or nothing and uh, realized that music wasn't going to work. So I came up with a plan B, joined the military. I uh, got to travel the world for a number of years, uh, met a girl, got married, settled down, had a family. Music kind of fell by the wayside. Um, fast forward 20 years, uh, that marriage ended. And uh, my sister, who is probably one of my biggest fans, told me that uh, if I needed to start playing again, basically. Uh, a year later, I released my first album. And it was all songs written uh, while I was going through a divorce. So they were very angry songs. <laughs> okay. Uh, a few years after that, well, about a year and a half after that, actually, I released a, uh, a second EP uh, entitled To Watch A Vita, which was songs I had written about genocide in Africa. Uh, something that was pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, and then uh, I joined a band. Uh, I was just hired gun guitar player, played with them for about six years, and I uh, was having a blast and everything, but it, it got to be a little much. You know, everybody in the band was working full-time day jobs, and uh, the, the band was starting to have a little bit of success, but not enough that any of us could quit our jobs. Okay. So, so uh, I, I said I was getting a little burned out. So I said basically that I needed a, a, a brief hiatus. And uh, that hiatus actually, which was going to originally be a month or two, turned into 12 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty surprising. Um, but uh, then uh, the pandemic happened and uh, my full time day job, I was out and about. I worked through the whole pandemic, which was pretty stressful. And when things started coming out of that, I realized I was in kind of a bad place mentally. Um, so uh, I decided I was going to start playing music again, uh, just for my own personal therapy, 
you know, just it was something I enjoyed, something I loved, and it was something that took my mind off of everything else that was going on. And so I had absolutely no intention of, of getting back into the scene. Uh, but as I started uh, playing, you know, and I was playing, when we're kids, we play for the pure enjoyment and for the innocence of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the mindset I was going to bring into it this time. And I was, I was playing for just for the pure enjoyment. And But before long, my muse showed up and kind of smacked me in the back of the head and said, oh, welcome back. I got a whole bunch of songs for you to write now. <laughs> <laughs> and I started creating. And uh, I realized, well, what, what good are these songs if nobody's ever going to hear them? Uh, I was really proud of them. And uh, I decided, all right, well, I guess I'm going to release an album. And here we are, back in the scene. A lot, lot deeper than I had planned on going, but I yeah. never heard of it, you know? Excellent. So what what was, what was is your muse that made you really get back into this? Uh, well, it's funny, but she just kind of showed up one day, and uh, I don't know who she is. I call her a she. I've never seen her or anything, but uh, it's just, it's kind of a cliche when, when we talk to certain musicians about they say, oh, well, the song was just floating in the universe and it just found me and filtered itself out through me. But a lot of the songs on this record, that's kind of the way they came. Uh, I just started noodling in, in the studio, playing around, and all of a sudden a melody came and I'd build off of that and build off of that. And next thing I knew, I had a song. Uh, there are a couple on the album that uh, were written for a specific purpose, like Russian Warship. Um, that one was... Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, story of the Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island, Ukraine. After uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine, a Russian warship uh, basically told them they needed to surrender or they would be attacked. And the Ukrainians, in uh, no uncertain terms, told the Russians where to go. And so uh, I, try, I wrote that song with trying to envision some of the emotions that the Ukrainian soldiers were feeling while they were waiting for the Russians to attack. Gotcha. And that's what, that's where that song came from. Okay. Uh, but like Unquiet Ghost, I was just rehearsing to do a show and this melody just popped into my head and I started playing it and inside of 10 minutes I had the song. And there's uh, there's a line in a Josh Ritter song uh, called The Bone of Song where uh, the song is basically about finding a bone in the woods and there are lyrics in, engraved in the bone. And if you find the bone and put it back, it will give you a song. But there's a line in there. It says, um, lucky are you who finds me in the wilderness, for I am the only unquiet ghost that does not seek rest. And I wrote this song and it was like, where did that come from? And it's like, I have no idea where it came from, but I figured the unquiet ghost brought it to me. So that's what I titled. I titled it was Unquiet Ghost.
cool. So, do you think some of this has to do with your military experience? Uh, this particular record, probably not, no. Um, okay. A lot of these were just songs that just kind of came to me as I was playing around, and it's like, ooh, what was that? And I'd build off of it and uh, things like that. Nothing on the album is specifically related to my military experience because uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, so kind of diving back into a recap of everything that you've said so far, you said back when you were 17, your dad basically kind of showed you that in his own way that he felt that you weren't able to become a professional musician as this was going to become your profession as listeners are out there what do you think your dad was right about that made sure that that was the actual path for you to take was not to become a professional musician at that time well it's not that he didn't want me to be a professional musician he knew i wasn't good enough at that point and the way he drilled that into my head was i came home from school one day and uh he said to me he said so what's your plan you're not doing great in school you're probably not going to go on to college so what is your plan and i said well i'm going to go to nashville my dad was big in the country music world and he said i do you think you're good enough and i said yeah uh, my dad was the guy on the side of the stage the hired gun guitar player he played with some of the biggest names in country music in the 70s and uh, that's who i wanted to be and he said okay cool and he got up and walked out of the kitchen and the next day I came home from school and there was an envelope on the table. I opened it up and there was $500 cash, uh, a Greyhound bus ticket, and a list of names and phone numbers. And he said, you're going to Nashville this weekend. And he said, all I want you to do is just spend the weekend walking up and down 16th Avenue, which at the time was the street all the major recording studios were on. And so I did that. You know, that was back in the days when you could send your 17-year-old boy off to a different state and not really have to worry right. about it too much. It didn't take me long to realize that these guys playing for, you know, change on the street corners weren't good enough to get jobs. And they were a lot better than me. So it was kind of my dad's way of making me figure it out myself. So that's when I came home and said, well, all right, now I got to come up with a plan B. Gotcha. Uh, and and my, I fully intended on pursuing music, but, you know, life gets in the way a lot of times and things like that. So. Right. Okay. No, that that's a really interesting story. It's like, like you said, you know, if he would have just said, no, you're not good enough, you probably would have not listened to one word he said and, you know, fought against it. But Exactly. Your own experience, you went, okay, well, am I going to be dedicated enough to become better than these people? Yes or no? And obviously, you made that decision. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and he didn't He didn't want to see me go down to Nashville and then, you know, be living on the street starving. <laughs> right. Exactly. When No parent wants to see that happen. They want exactly, to see their yeah, kids see successful. Now, obviously, you, are, um, you were in the military. Um, <laughs> did you do anything musical in the military or was it something a different branch of the military that you were a part well, of? well no i was in i was in the coast guard okay uh, and uh my first duty station was kodiak island alaska and while i was there i met a fellow banjo player uh so we formed a little group and uh we did a cassette tape it was we didn't know anything about vinyl pressing or anything at that time so we went into the studio and uh recorded i think seven or eight songs and just put them on a cassette tape um and it was just bluegrass covers, that kind of a thing. It was just guitar and banjo. Uh, and during that experience in the studio, it was like, okay, I want to do more of this. This was fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we played played some shows on the bass, and there wasn't a whole lot to do in the city of Kodiak. It's a city of 5,000 people, and probably 4,000 of them are commercial fishermen. Uh, so, you know, the the bars get kind of rowdy when the guys are in from, <laughs> in from right. fishing. Yeah. Things like so uh, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunities to play, but we, we played some shows on the base at the officer's club and the enlisted men's club and things like that. And then uh, from there, I got transferred to Two Rivers, Wisconsin, uh, where I, I had joined a, a country band. I grew up country. Um, I didn't even realize anything but country existed until I was 12 when my cousin played Here Comes the Sun for Me by the Beatles and blew my mind, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I uh, came back from Alaska, formed a country cover band, uh, and to, did that for a little while. And then, you know, met a woman, got married, had a family, and life kind of got in the way. Right. So that was my first hiatus for music, which lasted almost 20 years. Yeah. And then around, if I'm figuring this out correctly, you know, going backwards from what you talked about before, you, <clears throat> about 
mid 2000s, you know, between 2000 2010 is when you started your kind of like your back to music with a band. Was that around that time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, when would that have been? Um, yeah, right around mid bids. Yeah. Um, and uh, I started, you know, I started. I wrote my my album, uh, which is titled uh, I "Never Want to Meet Another You." That's the one I wrote after I got divorced. <laughs> right. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, the the guy that owned the studio that I recorded that in, uh, we ended up becoming really good friends, and he invited me to join his band, kind of as a hired gun guitar player. And I did that. It was a band out of Sheboygan called Icarus Drifting, uh, which is the band is still around. They're called the Bellwether now. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, Eric Cox and Thea, um, Marissa, and uh, Corey. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so after after Icarus kind of fell apart, Eric reformed Icarus into the Bellwether. But yeah, I played with Eric and Icarus Drifting for about six years, and. Uh, that's during that time I released my second album and then we released an album as Icarus and things like that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this newest album that you um, recently released. Um, kind of give the listeners kind of like a, a, a summary of from beginning to end, how it started, where you recorded it, things you kind of learned from that process and the release story behind it. Yeah. So I, I wrote these songs Um they, you know, over the course of about 16 or 18 months. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, I live in Fond du Lac, and a friend of mine uh, owns a studio. It's not a pro, that's not his business, but he, you know, he has a studio on the side. He's a music teacher and things like that. And uh, he offered to record it for me, so I took him up on it. And uh, just kind of laid out the songs that I did and then, you know, picked picked the, the sequence that I wanted to put them in. And uh, one of the reviews that I got on the record said it's uh, it's it's a journey going through the desert and seeing almost every single different terrain a desert would have to offer, uh, which is it's pretty interesting. Um, the songs were not written to be grouped together. Uh, they weren't written specifically for this album. I would just write a song and I'd log it. And then pretty soon I realized these songs all kind of go together with a little bit of variation. So they don't all sound the same. Right. Um, and the title came, uh, from something a, a woman said to me after a live show one time, she said, your music just makes me feel so carefree. Like I want to drive through the desert to burn a million dollars. And I went, Oh, I got to write that down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Very yeah. catchy, very, very thought provoking title. Um, now the, the tunes that you had mentioned earlier, uh, Russian and ghost, are those part of that album? Yes, they are both on this album. Okay. Uh, it, it's Russian warship. Uh, and there is another part to the name of that song, but it's got a bad word in it. So, <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Uh, and so it's, yeah. And then uh, the other one is called Unquiet Ghost. Unquiet uh, Ghost. The, the, my favorite song on the album is Low Flying Owls, uh, which was one of those songs that uh, just kind of came to me. I just wrote it one day, and I played it for my wife, and uh, we were trying to come up with a title for it. And because a lot of times, you know, it's, it's instrumental. There's no story, right? Sometimes there's a story behind it, but it may not be obvious to the listener because there's no words. Right. So uh, I, I try to either name the song after a feeling that the song may evoke, or I go the complete opposite direction and just name it something really offbeat and off the wall. Um, and this one, yeah, I had written the song, and she said, well, let's just marinate on it for a few days and see if something doesn't come to us. And uh, we actually saw a road sign. Uh, and, you know, those yellow diamond-shaped signs, like a deer crossing sign. And, and it said, caution low flying owls <laughs> and my wife turned to me and looked at me and i had the song on, on, on recorded and she's like play that song so i played it and she went oh my god that's it it's low and she says i just envisioned an owl just kind of soaring through the woods with its wings stretched out and uh, so that's what i titled it
you have played out, obviously, mm-hmm. multiple different uh, states and venues. What can you kind of tell the listeners about your experience um, of the local attitude that you have experienced over the years that you have played out live, good and bad? Uh, well, the the bad is the typical, and I'm sure almost every musician out there will, will will agree with me when you know you show up to a gig and there's five people there, and four of those five people are talking, <laughs> not yeah. paying any attention, right? You know, and that's just part of it, right? Uh, but you know, it, it's it, there's that one person standing there uh, paying attention, and uh, that's you, know, you got to bring your stadium show, your A game, even if it's just one person. You know, um, the good stuff is is far outweighs the bad, of course. Uh, but it's it's like one of the best experiences that ever happened to me uh, after a live show well, and during a live show. Actually, is I have a song uh, I wrote called "River of Souls," and it's about um, genocide in Africa. It's a pretty dark, heavy song. Um, but I was playing a small coffee shop in Sheboygan. And I saw a woman in the audience just happened to notice she was crying. I mean, I'm like, you know, bawling, ugly crying. And we made eye contact and she got up and ran into the bathroom while I'm on stage playing the song, looking at her husband who was sitting next to her thinking, well, you jerk, what'd you say to her? You know, (laughs) (laughs) and uh, finished out the show. And she came up to me after the show and she says, I've never been moved so much in my life as I have from that song. And I said, you were crying because of my song. She goes, yes. And I was like, okay, I can retire now. (laughs) It's like I touched somebody that deeply that I made her ugly cry. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's, it's it's, a highlight for sure. Right. It's, it's something that an artist wants some kind of, emotion evoked from something that they're doing either from a painting or a picture or a musical right. composition just know that they can you know touch somebody with a human emotion with what they're doing then that lets them know that they're on the right track of what they're trying right. to accomplish right. well even the negative stuff you know is, right. is okay a lot of times I, I had a song on my first record called why and it was rather political um and I was playing it one day, and apparently this gentleman in the audience had an opposite political opinion of mine. And he got up, and he gave me the finger, and he walked out. And it's like, okay, that's fine, you know. And then a woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, I'm sorry that you had to deal with that. I said, I'm not. She goes, well, why not? I said, it's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. My song elicited a reaction. Yep. I would rather get a negative reaction than no reaction. Right. You know? And so. At least he was listening. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> told me a lot. Right, exactly. Um, so we've talked about the local scene. We've talked about your current project. Um, now, obviously, you, you talked about being divorced, but it also sounds like you're remarried. Is your wife of now, is she a musician as well, or is she just a really good music lover? She's a music lover. Um, she is an artist, but she's a, a graphic designer. So, which is great because she does all the artwork for my albums, and <laughs> everything like that. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a built-in art director, but uh, no, she's a music lover for sure, and uh, we we go see a lot of shows together, and uh, pretty diverse uh, as far as our tastes. You know, uh, like uh, two weeks ago, we were in Milwaukee at Pfizer to see Tool. And then nice. the very next, the very next night, we were in Madison to see a Ukrainian folk band called Daka Braka. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it's it's good to explore all the different types of music out there. You know, especially if when like you, um, where you just started out, you didn't think there was anything besides country out there till you were twelve. Now mm-hmm. you're exploring all these different kinds of music, and I think it just makes you a better not just a better musician, but just makes you a better person overall just to experience all these different kinds of music out there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, you know, and I draw a little influence from certain things. Um, I was just playing the other day in the studio, and I have a loop pedal that I play with. I don't do a lot with it live, but uh, I just started this little riff, and I was like, that sounds kind of tool-like. So I just built off of it and nice. played with it, you know, and it's just... Had I not been exposed to that music, I probably never would have done that. So, right. yeah, I like to expose myself to a lot of different styles and genres. Now, um, one of the questions I ask is about, like, work-life balance. Um, you haven't really said you're retired or not, but 
do you have like a work life balance um, difficulty, or is it kind of pretty much you're you have a good balance going there? Uh, I think it's it's probably it's pretty decent. I mean, it's work definitely is the predominant. I do have a day job, predominant factor in my in my life right now. Um, I work ten hour days. And uh, I have a almost hour drive to and from work. So you know, I've got, yeah, I live in Fond du Lac. I work in Appleton. Uh, so it's, it's 47 miles from my house to my job. Um, so I do spend a lot of time in work mode, you know. Uh, I come home and uh, uh, try, you know, like Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm done earlier than um, I am on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So I, I have time to play after work. Uh, and things like that. Uh, on Wednesdays and Thursdays, I get a little bit of time in the morning to play. But uh, my wife does work Fridays, so Friday is kind of my day. You gotcha. know? It, it's my day to just do what I need to do and what I want to do and things like that. And then come the weekend, if we don't have anything going on, then I go in the studio and you know play some more. Or it, it's it's pretty rare that we don't have something going on at least one of the days on the right. weekend. Um, are you going in out and um, still performing with the new album? Are you getting good feedback? What's the what's the deal on that? Yeah, I'm in booking mode right now. Um, I've got a show booked at Oak Brewing in West Dallas uh, in April. It's one of the Amplified Artists sessions that they do there. Uh, and right now, I'm I'm so being an instrumental artist, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not a bar scene kind of a guy. So. Uh, my stuff just is not made for that particular type of, of venue. So I'm trying to find, you know, wine bars or maybe smaller places uh, to play there. Um, my wife and I happen to love the Door County areas, and there's a lot of places up there. So I'm doing mm -hmm. some bookings up there. Um, there are some places in Sheboygan. You know, I'm trying to trying to stick within an hour or two of my house, maybe two and a half if it's if it's a really cool place, uh, <laughs> but. That's not to say I wouldn't take a, you know, if somebody booked me a great show in Minneapolis or Chicago, I'd definitely jump all over it. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in hardcore booking mode right now. And then, um, is there any gigs? I mean, you talked about some gigs where, you know, you had some great emotional reaction from the audience. Was there one where you went and saw um, someone perform and had a great impression on you? Yeah, um, so one of my wife's and my both favorite artists is uh, a guy out of Ireland named Damien Rice. Hmm. Uh, he's a singer-songwriter, you know. Yep. Uh, he does. I, I kind of am reluctant to always say he's from Ireland because that immediately conjures up the image of, oh, he does Irish music, but he does not. He is mm -hmm. a singer-songwriter. Right. Uh, but we've seen him a couple times, and we're actually going to see him in Chicago on the 1st of December. Um, but uh, he played the Auditorium Theater a few years ago, walked out on that stage, and I don't know what the capacity of the theater is. It's probably six or 8,000, but he walked out on that stage solo, just an acoustic guitar, and that place fell silent for two hours. I mean, it was amazing. I don't know how you do that one guy in acoustic guitar. I'm working on figuring it out. <laughs> this, yeah, it's just like, you're just mesmerized by someone that can go up there, just them and, and an instrument and just control your attention for that amount of time. It's just exactly. Yeah. It's, it's awe inspiring. Just, and, and, and it's just, he's just so, I don't know if you're familiar with his music at all, but it's, it's pretty deep too, you know, and it's, it's the type of music that you really should listen to. And most of his, his fans realize this. So most of them do. They just, they, they're all in, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's it's that's definitely one of our favorites, and I would love to be able to figure out how to do what he did with that size audience. I would, yeah. You you would think it's like a lot of those songs. You would think that that artist does it means something to a lot of different people. Each one of those songs, and it just everybody's there to experience that in a live setting. Right, right. Well, it's like Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters said one time. He said, "You can sing a song." to 85,000 people and they will sing it back to you for 85,000 different reasons. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'm pretty much out of questions. I mean, you've given okay. us a lot of stuff to, um, to ponder and think about and, um, reflect on. Is there anything that you would like the listeners to know about before I let you go? 
uh, just check out the album. You know, it's available on most of the streaming platforms, uh, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music. Uh, it is on YouTube as well. Um, if you don't have any, I'm finding a lot of my fans are of my age and a lot of them don't have Spotify and things like that. So it's up on YouTube as well. Uh, but yeah, just go check it out. If you like it, hop on over to, to iTunes and, you know, click that old buy button. That would be great. There you go. Are you on um, Bandcamp as well? I am. Yep. Okay. So I will put all your links into the um, description of this episode so people can just click on that and they can go right. right to that and, you know, hopefully, you know, support you by buying, you know, your music, like you said, on iTunes or over sure. at Bandcamp. So, yeah, uh, yeah. it is uh, all, all of the socials and it's all under the Elysians too. Title. Okay. That's, yeah, that's one more thing I was going to ask you, but I forgot is like, where did that name come from? So Elysian means blissful or delightful which hopefully people will find my music. Uh, and Stu comes from a, a lot of my influences growing up. I've taken little bits and pieces and kind of all thrown them in the pot to come up with my own little stew of a style. And I figured by doing that also, if I ever work with any other musicians, they will just be added ingredients in the stew. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Pat, thank you so much for being on the Wisconsin Music Podcast. Like I said, it's been a pleasure talking with you, learning about your journey through music, and I hope the listeners enjoyed hearing this as well. Yeah, I do too. Thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. It's awesome what you do to help uh, support Wisconsin musicians. That's great. And then that's it. So um, I'll do this stuff uh, um, post-editing and everything, and then I will let you know when this will go live. It'll probably be like, I'm thinking not till the early new year, like January, February is when this will probably come out. So Okay. And like you said, you mentioned a gig in April, so people will catch that be- way before that happens. And then they can – you have a website? I don't have a website, no. I've just okay. got, uh, got, the, got the Instagram. And the, my Facebook is under my name. Okay. Uh, Pat Zyduck is a poet. I tried changing the name to Elysian Stew. And all these people kept sending me messages. Who are you? How do I know? Because <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of followers on Facebook, and I thought it would be easier just to change my name than it will be to start over. Right. Uh, but I, that, I realized that didn't work, so gotcha. I just changed it back to my name. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Pat, once again, thank you so much for being on and looking forward to putting this all together for you and letting you know when it's ready to go. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Well, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Wisconsin Music Podcast. Once again, I'm Zach Fell, your host and creator of the Wisconsin Music Podcast, where I love to amplify the great sounds coming out of the Wisconsin state. We have great talent here, great support, great listeners. Thanks to Fox City's Indie Radio for syndicating this on Thursdays and Sundays, along with their other great programming. So make sure you check out the Fox City's Indie Radio. Thanks to our great guests this week. Legion Stu, also known as Pat Zida. Make sure you check out his newest recording, Driving Through the Desert to Burn a Million Dollars, available on most streaming sites and Bandcamp. If you'd like to be on the show, just go up to WisconsinMusicPodcast.com, fill out the guest request form up at the top, ask for your email and your name, and then I'll send you an auto email asking you for more information. If you are enjoying these episodes, please consider donating to the Wisconsin Music Podcast. Donations help pay for the website and putting the podcast up on streaming services, and also getting our name out there to all Wisconsinites and others that are interested in our great music here in Wisconsin. Donations are secured through PayPal and Stripe. All you have to do is go to the website and click on Donate to WMP. You can also head over to our Instagram and Facebook pages and like us there. Leave some comments. Also go to the podcast review section of your podcast player and leave a five-star review. It would be great. You can also head over to YouTube and watch the interviews and leave comments there as well. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you next time.